societies usually want to have their identity as a central plank to depend on when it comes to the European context. They have witnessed an influx of migrants, uh, but these migrants are integrated uh, as opposed to uh, our migrants here because uh, we do not provide uh, permanent uh, status for them. The issue does not relate of the cocoon ethnicities. Uh, no, it is to do with the identity at large, uh, whereby if some migrants went to Europe, uh, then the programs would be put in place in order to rehabilitate them, to reintegrate them in the culture without imposing the the solution of their identity. So there is a, a general mood, uh, there's a general public that says integration is very important and uh, principles and values ought to be common to preserve every single body's rights. In the Gulf, uh, there is no such thing. There is no integration policy. Integration might be spontaneous, but there is no plans for such integration. Sometimes it is objectionable or refused because of the fear vis-a-vis -vis our identity. So what I would say, why wouldn't we review uh, uh, this status? Why don't we review the interpretation or our interpretation of the identity itself? What do we need? Do we need uh, to be uh, integrated uh, with the globalization or do we have to be estranged and cocooned? Uh, can we be open-minded? but open-minded to which culture? The foreign culture or the neighborly culture or the culture of the people who live with us here in our region, locals and expatriates. As a matter of fact, we do understand that uh, tribes play a major role in our societies. As you see on this uh, map, uh, you can see these uh, tribes and the geographies. So these ethnicities are closed up because they depend not only on ethnicities, but they depend on some structural elements that cannot be superseded. The tribe cannot dispense with such structure. So those who do not belong to a tribe, they will be a failure. They indeed define. Uh, ourselves and they define our life and they define our conduct with the other. So this kind of uh, 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 categorization is very rigid and uh, very inflexible. This is the problem that we are facing uh, despite the fact that we are a uh, 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 cocoon per se, but we are compelled to deal with other ethnicities uh, that are totally different from us. And there is no com no common uh, 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 values, no religious one, no traditions, uh, no habits, no customs. So there is a major problem. I uh, uh, suppose uh, 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 to have uh, a conference that tackles this issue, to talk about the demography, not in the way of affecting the economy, but the society itself. This is a table, uh, and uh, you might probably know about the statistics of the inhabitants and so on and so forth in the GCC countries. And this uh, uh, talks about uh, the percentage or the proportion between the expats and the locals. As you know, the locals uh, in most of the GCC countries resemble minorities culturally and uh, economically. If we are talking about uh, those who talk Arabic, if we want uh, uh, to look through the identity and relate it to Arabic, we can see that 30 or 40 percent only of the people who live in the GCC countries speak Arabic. So this is an imbalance that has surfaced. But this major uh, uh, imbalance is uh, uh, do they uh, warrant uh, 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 being closed up or uh, cocooned, and how can we? deal with this matter and be open-minded uh, 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 because we do have uh, mega projects uh, for uh, 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 decades to come. So this uh, structure will still be there 
and these ethnicities will still be here. And how could we protect the GCC countries from the international and regional changes that my colleague has alluded to and resemble indeed pressures on the GCC? And I uh, envisage that uh, they will be inflated in the future. There are studies that I had reviewed, uh, especially uh, the studies that target the youth, uh, whether they had retreated uh, when it comes to the identity. We saw that uh, uh, there are no shortcomings when it comes to the identity. So looking at the uh, uh, full half of the cup uh, was uh, the uh, main contribution. English is widespread, but we can look at it from a different angle. Uh, English uh, will be the, 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 the lingua franca for these societies uh, as per the communication with the others. Uh, they can surmount the obstacles. These societies cannot carry on without the English language, for example. Otherwise, the pressures will be more ominous. And uh, talking about these workers uh, and their rights and the human rights and issues and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, the, the issue that I'm floating here is how to make diversification in the Gulf states a part of the social capital. Can we codify the immigration? Can we put a cap, for example, on the immigration? If we say that uh, the language ought to be a common value in order to alleviate the impact of the diversity of the cultures, we can see that uh, a number of workers cannot indeed speak English in the first place, so the language barrier will still be there. They cannot, for example, live in residential areas because of the neighborhood kind of codes uh, uh, so that they can be less isolated uh, uh, as uh, they uh, work in uh, 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 a residence that uh, uh, is uh, uh, defined by uh, the workers themselves, the males. Uh, the male workers, uh, if we can have them living in a certain area, or perhaps uh, look at the matter from a hierarchical kind of point, or this might not work properly. They might have uh, organized themselves, and they uh, use, indeed, uh, the social media to uh, 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 build bridges amongst themselves. But still, the social media Unlike what's happening in the West, they can emphasize the uh, social acquaintances between them, but they do not reach out for the other communities. They reach out for themselves. Uh, unlike what takes place in the West, the Qataris and the uh, Gulf uh, uh, people derive less benefit from the social media, albeit that uh, uh, the surveys uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, allude to the fact that there is a, a boom in the usage of uh, the social media uh, uh, from the locals in the Gulf uh, states and they use it as uh, a marketing tool and commerce and so on and so forth. But when it comes to uh, 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 organizing uh, uh, some areas uh, and so on and so forth, it does not relate to the uh, a culture of organization in our civil societies, uh, they lack the organizational skills. So we have groups uh, that uh, have religious interests, for example, groups that have art-related interests or culture-related interests, but the organi organization skills are still lacking. Uh, in the future, the impact uh, might be different. We need uh, a long time or long term uh, study to understand uh, uh, such uh, uh, changes uh, and their impact uh, on the role of the society vis a vis such networks of social media. There are a number of recommendations, but uh, by and large, the main issue is uh, uh, to do with how can we integrate the cultural diversification as a social capital in line with the developmental policies and the goal. Thank you. Microphone, please. Microphone. Shukran jazeelan. Thank you, uh, doctor. And thank you very much uh, for talking about the identity. We'll move to the second paper uh, by Dr. Ahmed Fouad Ibrahim bin Ghazi. He will be talking about demography and uh, the development uh, 
requirements in the GCC countries. Dr. Ahmed Al-Mughazi, he is a professor at the Lahai uh, University in the Netherlands, and he is an expert at the ESQA, and he is a mentor in uh, the Sultanate of Oman. He uh, uh, deals with the issues of demography and uh, strategic policies. He has published uh, essays and papers, uh, and he has a PhD from the Cairo University. Fifteen minutes, please. In the name of Allah, the Most Gracious, the Most Merciful, the paper will be talking about the following. So I'm going to talk about the demographic makeup in the GCC countries, the relationship between development and the demographic makeup is always controversial. So we have seen differences between the different uh, researchers. Uh, some of them see them as a source of pressure, especially when it comes to Maltese as a researcher. That means that the increase in the demography will have a negative impact. And there is an optimistic group that says if it is being used adequately, it would be a source of development and advancement. A third view is in between these two last groups. It says it depends on how this uh, demographic increase uh, would be uh, uh, used, we can indicate uh, how the demography is going to be inimical to development or very useful and uh, conducive to development. So the question is how can we understand this kind of the, uh, relationship between these two components, so the relationship between demography and development. Uh, people would have a positive develop, uh, impact on development and also uh, the difference this is only a result that it is not uh, standing from one sources. Although the GCC countries understand the differences, they understand how they should overcome their challenges, and this is going to shed light on them. There are a number of demographic challenges that have an impact on development in the GCC countries which can be summarized in the following question. How does the demographic reality has an impact on development in the GCC countries? And we have a number of questions that are branched out from this main question. What are the main components of demography? How would it impact development? How does uh, the makeup of society have an impact on economy? And what are the challenges and how can we overcome them? So the importance of this study, so there is a close relationship between the demography and the requirements of development in economy in the GCC countries, the strategies and policies, these are the main components and pillars of development. So we're going to study the main components of demography and also give a number of examples and try to see how they work and also we talk about the challenges that people are uh, talking about and the methodologies that should be for in order to overcome these challenges in development. So it is possible for this uh, demographic makeup that is impact, uh, that is expanding, can uh, present uh, to challenges. It and can lead into an increase or it can lead to a decrease in terms of uh, economic development. So I have a number of methodologies that I'm going to follow and I'm going to relate to a number of uh, sources and references. And this is the development of demography in the Arab world from 93 million in the Arab world to 347 in 2010. And when we see this table, if we see the GCC countries from 5 million to almost 40 million, so the people in the GCC people, so the total makeup of demography, 63% is uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar, 4% and uh, Saudi Arabia. has in excess of 60% of the total population of the GCC countries. The non-citizens, uh, uh, I mean 61% uh, in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, 54% in Bahrain. So I would like to clarify here that uh, Qatar and the Emirates are 
at the top of the list of those people who have uh, more, uh, I mean, uh, non-national, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the total population is, is, is made up of expats. So the demographic development has uh, preserved its nature in the GCC countries, as it was the case in the Arab world. So the average uh, growth in the GC countries, as we have seen, Qatar, Qatar is 10%, and after that, uh, Emirates 9.1%, Saudi uh, uh, 12%. So how can we... You can see that uh, Qatar, uh, as you know, we are talking about 2010 and 2016, uh, Qatar will be doubled in, in its inhabitants uh, in Emirates in 2018, 2020 in Oman, and uh, in Saudi Arabia 2032, and in Oman is 2043. Uh, the inhabitants will be doubled in number. So we can see that Qatar will be there before the other GCC countries. So some of the uh, 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 components uh, of the natural growth of the inhabitants, uh, like the fertili fertility rate, uh, the maternity uh, and the infant, the infant uh, 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 death rates, we can see that uh, the averages in the GCC are on a par with the developed countries, uh, and uh, this in line with the indexes of the a global report with Sweden, Norway, America, France, and Canada, and so on and so forth. When it comes to the size of immigration, as you can see, in 2010 and 2000, the Arab world has received 25 million migrants, 13, sorry, they resemble 4.5% of the inhabitants of the Arab world in 2000 and 7.4% in 2010. This is the expectancy rate. As you know, there are plenty of youngsters in the Arab world. We can see that the age cohorts of the youth uh, has been inflated. And uh, in 2010, we've seen that uh, uh, the youngsters are still burgeoning. However, when it comes to the gender-based uh, classifications, uh, uh, as you know, uh, women now work more than in the past, uh, and so the numbers have changed slightly. This is the, uh, 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 these are the numbers of uh, the uh, age structure. As you can see, uh, it, it is 129%. Uh, the average is 105, 106, 107. The comparison between males and females, it is 142 in Oman, 148 in Kuwait, 312 in Qatar, 185 in Bahrain. And this indeed uh, relates to the uh, 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 expats, uh, whereby males are uh, mainly coming from different world. We can see that uh, the concentration in the youth from 15 to 21, and as you know, the uh, base of the pyramid is wide. That means uh, it goes through the youth stage. Uh, there's also uh, other uh, indexes of uh, the demography that uh, reflect the uh, socioeconomic situation in the Gulf state in Saudi Arabia. It's 210, 164 in the Emirates, 154 in Oman. And as you can see on the table, in terms of the illiteracy rates, uh, the rates uh, are meager. However, they are indeed uh, high when it comes to the uh, uh, studies, if you compare it with the studies that uh, uh, in here we have, uh, we are talking here about the uh, uh, working force. And this uh, table illustrates a very important issue is the relative uh, distribution of the workers uh, uh, per the industry and uh, the participation of such workers in the GDP of the country. So we can see that uh, uh, there is a focus uh, on the services, 
like the workers as well as the mining and the oil sector when it comes to the economic revenue. And here, there are some neighbors, uh, some uh, uh, rates, uh, and we compare it between males and females and the expatriates and the locals. Uh, when it comes to the uh, public sector and the private sector, we can see that uh, the expatriates play a major role in the private sector in all the GCC countries and in the hegemony of the locals on the public sector. This table shows uh, the distribution in accordance with the work itself, and uh, here the percentage of the unemployment rates. Uh, it is uh, more uh, among the females, uh, and this is understandable. When it comes to the challenges, uh, uh, I think that uh, the study has uh, alluded to the imbalances uh, of uh, uh, such matters that are negative and still growing. First, when it comes to the demographic imbalances, the expatriates, as you know, uh, exceed 50% in general. 58.8.10% or 58.2%, and they come from all walks of life, Arabs and non-Arabs, and this uh, makes the identity of the Gulf uh, prone to dissolution, uh, whereby the locals have been uh, 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 minorities. Uh, there's also uh, an imbalance in the size uh, of the age cohort uh, uh, sometimes uh, this uh, uh, affects uh, the change uh, of uh, uh, the economy, especially in Qatar and in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, when it comes uh, to the uh, uh, remittances as well, or the dependency dependency rates as well, uh, resembles an obstacle when it comes to the illiteracy. Illiteracy uh, plays a direct role in the workforce domain, and especially when it comes to polishing their skills. Uh, and this needs treatment, especially in Saudi Arabia and in Oman. When it comes to the urbanization uh, rate, uh, when it comes to 100% in Kuwait and Qatar, and uh, this uh, uh, exerts or burdens uh, the services uh, in a negative uh, manner, the electricity and the utilities, uh, all of them will be put under pressure. And it will play a major role in the pollution uh, whereby uh, uh, some of these people flee the cities and go to the remote areas uh, and they become poor again uh, 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 in this uh, uh, matter. What is that? What is that? The uh, imbalances uh, in the workforce, we have uh, indeed uh, imbalances when it comes to the uh, focus of the expatriates on the private sector and the focus of the locals in the public sector, and this is unique. Summarize, summarize. Uh -huh. <laughs> there is also an imbalance in other uh, sectors, uh, with the exception of Saudi Arabia. And as we have seen in the different uh, table, uh, with the exception of the mining sector, Bahrain was relatively balanced compared to other uh, countries of the world. And this poses the problem of uh, uh, development in the different uh, countries of the GCC countries. And uh, these uh, migrant workers uh, have uh, contributed to the development uh, in the different GCC countries. So unemployment, although in general the average of unemployment is very low, but uh, within certain sectors it is very high, and it reaches uh, to 7%. Uh, and 54% in women in Saudi Arabia. And also, we have seen in this study that there is a decrease in the contribution of women in uh, development in GCC countries. Even the GCC women themselves, uh, these indicators, they show that women's contribution in development, I'm talking about GCC women, is very weak indeed. 
a conclusive remark. The different studies have shown that the increase in population, which is expanding even further, it had two influences, one negative influence and positive influence. At the beginning, it led to development. They have led to economic development and other sectorial development. And uh, the other negative aspect is that it had a negative influence, uh, a pressure on uh, the total population on the state. It has led to imbalance uh, in the demographic uh, makeup, and also it has led to an imbalance on the distribution of the different uh, workers, uh, the concentration of foreign workers uh, and employees in the private sector, and the concentration of the local citizens in the public se uh, sectors. So this led to the fact uh, to finding all the regulations that would be necessary to overcome this uh, problem. We have to uh, find a kind of a balance when it comes uh, to expat population and also try to empower women and also to adopt policies that are in keeping with the needs of each and every state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctor, for your paper. And now we have a paper by Mr. Mahmoud Murad, and the title of the paper is The Future Horizons of Demog Demographic Expansion in the GCC country. Mahmoud Murad, he is a lecturer in political economy in the Lebanese University. He works in ESSCC in Paris 5678. Uh, he also uh, authored a number of articles uh, and he got his master's in uh, um, mathematics from Paris 7 uh, and also his PhD from Paris 7. The floor is yours, doctor. This is going to be deducted from the time allocated to you. Please take your time. Anyway, I would like to thank the organizers who have invited us to this very interesting conference. And I hope that the work that we are doing here today would be of help to our people here in the GCC countries. The study that I have conducted and that I'm going to talk about here deals with with the demography and the migrant workers. We're going to talk about the future horizons of this uh, demographic uh, development uh, and the migrant workers in the GCC countries. Uh, so we're going to talk about economic tricks uh, and the quantitative methods that we have uh, adopted in econometrics. So it requires math mathematical uh, methodologies that should be used and also we need to use of uh, uh, information technology and also a number of uh, mathematical models that control such a phenomenon. So this research paper dealt uh, with 42 series or time series that are divided into seven groups. In each uh, GCC countries, we have seen the demographic dynamism, the percentage of men against women. Uh, so the age group is between 15 and 64, and also the uh, average age, uh, and also the percentage of male against female or two females. So we're going to try to answer a number of questions. This 
are there any harmony between the, is there any harmony sorry between the different GCC countries when it comes to their uh, demographic uh, makeup uh, and are the GCC countries uh, moving into being a minority taking into account the level of expatriates and also what our uh, what are our predictions for the coming phase, which is 20, uh, 2020. So my colleagues talked about this uh, oil development, uh, the oil boom that has led uh, to attracting a number of uh, migrant workers, especially in the private sector, which has created a kind of a, ba a gap, uh, a hole between uh, uh, citizens and expats between male and females. We have got an introduction. We're going to study a number of literatures uh, that are specialized in this uh, uh, field. And also, we have something that is called the uh, uh, autogressive uh, integrating moving average models. This is a theory that was set by Fox Jenkins in the 70s and reached the West in the 80s. And we used to be students at the time. And these techniques, I mean, were very fashionable. All French people were trying to work on them, trying to work on how they anticipate the future based on these models. So what are the practical steps? So the natural uh, law is distributed, uh, I mean, and mathematics shows that all phenomena, if we do not see them today in harmony with this natural law, the more we expand the level of these uh, groups, so we have uh, six groups. We have st tried to study them to see the normal distribution, and we have found out uh, that uh, from these series, there are 29 time series who are subjected to natural distribution. And we have 6.1. And some of the other series, they are not subjected to this uh, methodology as per the law of Jalkbera, which leads to sconies or curtonies that do not support such kind of direct direction. So these uh, series uh, are subjected to this natural law. So the second question that we want to answer, are they stable, these series? What do we mean by stability here for those who are specialized in the field? Maybe it's easier for me to say that these series are stable. That means that the middle part is constant, is not related to time. And the variants are also constant, do not change with time. But if we study a kind of a phenomenon and we see that the average is related to time or the variants are related to time, that means that they are not stable. That we need. That means we need to have a number of transformations. And we are dealing with the ADF. This is a theory through which we can answer these questions. We have realized that all these series that we have, they are not stable, and they need what we need to have a kind of a differences for them to be stable. And based on that, we have built these mathematical models. I'm going to talk very briefly about them. So we take the demography, the total population between 1960 and 2012. We have 53 years, Saudi Arabia to Bahrain. So Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Oman, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain. Each country has its own demographic dynamism, but the mathematical model that impacts that track changes from one country to another. And in terms of the differences, we have delta cube. These are the third grade differences. Kuwait first grade, and so on and so forth. We find there are there is a lack of harmony even in this mathematical model that control this kind of demographic dynamism. And this is what you did in the other phenomena in terms of male, female, and the average, I mean, uh, life, and so on and so forth. Let's go back to our work. So the population, we have seen that this dynamism is exponential trend. This. Uh, implies it should change into a kind of a logarithm uh, and uh, we have reached a number of information. Uh, 
and in 2012, the total population of the GCC countries is 47 million. This includes uh, citizens and expats. So Saudi Arabia has the majority. And you know, the size of Saudi Arabia represents 84% of the total size of the whole GCC area. So based on the total population in the whole world, it represents 1.6 in the whole world. But in uh, the GCC, it is four or threefold of the total increase of the whole world. So. The expectations uh, in 2020, we're going to have 31 million in Saudi Arabia, the Emirates 15 million. This is the mathematical model that I'm following. So the model shows these are the results that we're going to have, and Oman and Kuwait and Qatar between four and four and a half million, and Bahrain 1.7 million. The population, if we see, Distinguished guests, in Saudi Arabia, Arabia, the Emirates, uh, more than half is male. There was a gap in Kuwait and then Qatar and then Bahrain. But in 2012, we have seen that this gap has been applied or, uh, I mean, found in all GCC countries, uh, not only a few of them. And consequently, there is a gender gap and uh, this is statistical. So the statistics and the total population of male and female is very much different. And there is a huge gap, as my colleagues have said. So there are expat workers. Most of them are male. And I've taken statistics uh, from the Center for Statistics in Saudi Arabia that shows in Saudi Arabia the uh, Saudi Arabian citizens, 50.9% uh, uh, are male and 49.1% are female. And uh, this is how God have cre has created us. We are almost equal. But when it comes to expatriates, uh, the expat total population of male, 70% are male, and 29.6% uh, uh, 29 is uh, female. So there is a huge gender gap. So the expectations of 2020, so the going to be an increase uh, to reach 69.03. Uh, of male and the rest of the GC countries, they're going to be an increase by 6%. So the age group, we have to be frank here. There is a huge development that has been achieved in terms of awareness uh, from a medical perspective. And uh, uh, this have led has led our brothers and sisters here in the GCC country to uh, increase the uh, life expectancy. And there is. There is also a kind of an annual growth for the, of this uh, uh, life expectancy. We have 9% in the Emirates. This is the average annual growth of life expectancy. This is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, similar to, I mean, uh, developed countries' average increases, increases, sorry. This age group, which is 15 years old to 64 years old, we have noticed that males coming from outside the uh, states of the GCC increase the number of males in society. That is why we find in Saudi Arabia 71.4 are male in society, 76% in the Emirates, and so on and so forth. As for the life expectancy, we have seen here two curves. We have one red and one blue. So the blue, this is the average growth for men for 2012. The red line is the average growth for women. As we have seen here, the blue line means that there is a higher average growth for men because women, they live longer. But the average growth for women each year is lower, but women, they live longer anyway, longer than men. So the second group is the Emirates, and then Qatar, and then Bahrain. 
and we have seen here a slight difference uh, with Kuwait in Saudi Arabia men they will live 75 years in 2020 79 for women and the same applies to Oman the Emirates and the other countries Kuwait 74 77 74 men 77 men Bahrain 76 for men 78 for women so it is clear that women live longer than men and but there is a lack of harmony between the different countries as for the laborers you can see here 1990 in 1990 these are the males 89%, 87%, 73%, 86%. In 2012, 86%, 84%, 84%. What have we noticed? There is a good increase, and the level of men or the percentage of men has decreased slightly. And there is a slight increase in female participation, particularly in Kuwait. And if you take the EU during that period, women contribute by 45%, which means 45% of women contribute as laborers and as, as employees in society. So I would like to compare here. I have tried to compare the GCC situation to China, Germany, France. You can see here the GCC countries. The Emirates, 9.7% increase in uh, laborers, and so on and so forth. In the United States of America and China, it's only 1.7, and in Germany, less than 1%. And consequently, by 2020, we're going to have the manpower in the GCC. Saudi Arabia would include, or would have 47% out of the total manpower in the whole GCC. Afterwards, the Emirates, uh, Kuwait, uh, Oman, uh, Saudi Arabia most manpower is foreign manpower and this is what we see from the statistic that we have the latest statistic that was conducted in 2008 so 50 percent of manpower are expat workers 94 percent is in qatar so in conclusion there is a huge development in terms of life expectancy there is a growth in the uh, age group 15 to 64 expat workers represent uh, 66 percent there is a gap between uh, the different components of expat workers also there is a gender gap and in ownership laws and if there is a law that does not allow this integration, that would lead to increasing this division between citizens and expats. Expat workers would have an impact on unemployment. I have an independent study in this respect. And uh, Dr. Cavallari knows uh, this research paper. We have studied unemployment as an independent uh, phenomenon. In the long run, this makeup, demographic makeup, uh, cannot continue as such, especially that the industrialized countries they have had have found a substitute source uh, for oil and gas. <coughs> In addition to that, we have uh, to continue instilling the roots of citizenship and identity, Arab identity. We believe that the wealth uh, of uh, people lies in the richness of their sciences. So he is uh, reading a poem. Thank you very much.
والآن لدينا حوالي نصف ساعة 25 دقيقة. We've got 25 minutes or half an hour for Q&A. Start by posing a question to the panelists. There is indeed demographic imbalance. That is crystal clear, and it started 40 years ago. And there are 40 years of talk and plans uh, in terms of uh, amending such a shortcoming. But uh, things are exacerbated rather than being limited. People are talking about uh, uh, managing the crisis. It is. Uh, a reality, uh, it is difficult to uh, uh, surmount it. Perhaps I would like uh, to pose uh, the question that relates to the solution. Do we think uh, that uh, we are exaggerating the matter? And at the end of the day, uh, the thing needs uh, codifying and accepting, perhaps? Or does the solution lie in? perhaps the lack of growth rather than the expediency of uh, growth. Do we have uh, a precedent in this matter? This is another question. Do we have uh, any societies that tackled this issue before? And what are the other uh, solutions, uh, innovative solutions? Can we resort to our Arab neighbors uh, to have uh, economic integration, perhaps? between the Arabs themselves, or at least between the GCC countries. We would like uh, to listen to some of the interventions. Perhaps we'll start with the gentleman here, first row. Microphone, please. <laughs> the papers are excellent. But indeed, they are academic, and we are tackling the issue of culture. But uh, the gentleman has uh, had a counter uh, argument. What I'm uh, interested in is the prognosis, and the, we have the extrapolation and the other issues. So the model that you have used is uh, a French one. It relates to the French speciality. Perhaps uh, you ought to have resorted to different models to be customized to the environment in the Gulf. There's also the forecasting you have depending on 2012. And as you know, this circumstance changes the petrol ought to be taken into consideration. 2008 and 2009, it was different. It reached $100 now, it is 60 per barrel. Per barrel. So uh, we cannot forecast and depend on only one year's data. But the presentation is academic. I don't, I'm not blaming you. When it comes to the solutions, I do appreciate uh, uh, your uh, sense of uh, nationalism, but we say all oh, Gulf people don't think of yourselves as depending on the fossil fuel. We have highly sophisticated technologies. We need for the Gulf to become a Singapore. They will solve the problem of the demography because highly skilled migrants would come. In Germany, 20% of the electric generation comes from the windmill and 48 from the renewable energy. Here we have the sun 24-7. So where is the solar system? Where is the solar panels? Where is the alternative or renewable energy? So the, pro the solution is to uh, uh, lessen our dependency on the fossil fuel and to attract the uh, uh, skilled workers. I like your presentation and I want a copy from this presentation. Thank you. I will definitely provide you with Shall we answer or shall we wait for further questions? We shall wait. 
thank you very much. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, paper of Dr. Kelsen focused on three issues, and she posed certain questions. Why don't we review the identity from different perspective? Would it be possible to review the development, and how could we codify the influx of the migrants? I think there is a misunderstanding here when it comes to development. The solution cannot be reached unless the political will is there and unless there is a review for the development part itself. Indeed, we need to focus uh, are these projects uh, uh, developmental projects or not? Because there is a difference between the development related genuine projects and the projects that create jobs to attract the foreign migrants and to perhaps have revenues that uh, uh, pour into the pockets of the elite or the wealthy. We need to attract highly skilled migrants and to integrate them on a par with what takes place in the rest of the world. Here, we are focusing about the fear. We are focusing about the competition between the Gulf countries to attract the foreign workers. And this will propel us in the future to nationalize the jobs. And this is dangerous. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have two questions. Dr. Asma from the Qatar University. I'd like to thank the panelists. But Dr. Kalsam has alluded to a very important point. We in the Gulf countries are the minorities of the minorities. And I hope you would understand me objectively when I talk about the genuine locals and sort them from those who are nationalized or naturalized, we can see indeed that the locals are the minorities of the minorities. Because if I have a dual nationality, I'm not doubting uh, the belonging, but if I have no roots in my country, I wouldn't have roots in the other countries. When it comes to the uh, 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 other issues, the uh, as you know, the percentage of the females are higher than the males. And in Qatar, a number of youngsters are victims of accidents, road accidents. And consequently, in the long run, some of the families indeed are thinking in a globalized fashion or a capitalist kind of fashion in order not to produce more uh, uh, children because the children will have uh, to have uh, money to spend on them and uh, we need to take this into consideration do we need to keep the pace with the globalization and to be open to the rest of the uh, uh, countries can i be competitive and can i uh, attract the brains uh, and uh, we have uh, plenty of examples but i will not dwell on them you have uh, just uh, said uh, talked about the uh, 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 migrant workers uh, who are mainly males. Perhaps most of them work in the construction uh, uh, sites, but uh, what is uh, more important is those who work in the houses because the children will learn from the domestic workers. And it has to do with the roots. Uh, we have deep rooted uh, uh, culture and we need to cleave to it. So our identity ought to be reserved. Are we reserving it? Are we reserving the Arabic language? It is a matter of existence. Uh, and uh, a number of conferences all across the world tackle the issue of identity. So if we think of the migrants, we need to think of the alternative mother uh, 
I mean the domestic uh, workers. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. We had another person. Thank you very much. My view in this uh, matter, I admire uh, the papers of the panelists, but I would like to say that uh, immigration to the Gulf countries will still continuing because uh, the Gulf countries produce oil and oil is intertwined with the uh, uh, global markets and that's why they cannot dispense with what taken, what's taken in place uh, in uh, uh, the world. We need, I think, in the Gulf state to reach out for the Iraqis and the Yemenis so that we can strike a balance. Because if they are open to every single country, they ought to be open to the neighborly countries, Yemen and Iraq. This is what the first point. The second point, we need to lay off the rentier system of uh, economy. We need to uh, uh, resort to the productive economy. We have to resort to the middle class uh, to polish their skills. This is very urgent so that uh, they can be beneficial and they can be integrated in the society as, the, as on a par with what America does or the EU does. So globalization is not a, a scary thing because if you have a vision, a strategic vision that transcends the uh, tribal bond, then they will be successful. Thank you. There are only 10 minutes. Uh, two more interventions, and then we'll come back to the panelists. I do apologize, but let's take three questions. Please be brief. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. First and foremost, I would like to thank all of you because it pertains to what's taking place in the Gulf countries, in particular, within the Arab context. I think my question is generic, but it is related to Dr. Kastam's paper when it comes to the integration matter. This is very important, and uh, it relates to as the gentleman said, the development that's taken place in the Gulf. There's also a, a, a challenge that relates to integration. I would like to wonder how we, as the Qataris and Gulf people of different levels, the, are we aware of uh, the importance of such matter? for the benefit of everyone. Please allow me uh, uh, to talk about the obstacles or the stumbling blocks. There are some problems that are based on, the, on pragmatism, on the relationship between the uh, worker and the employer in the Gulf and in Qatar. And this relationship uh, has been emulated uh, uh, in a multifaceted way. Uh, it has developed uh, in line with the uh, advancements in the economy and investment, but still we have obstacles and challenges that uh, need to propel us to be more courageous because this is very important uh, when it comes to integration. And lastly, when it comes to the liability, the, to have this relationship within uh, the framework of citizenship and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much. My question. to the 
demography and immigration, whether it affects the identity. I want to ask why don't we have a problem in Canada or in Australia because they attract workers from all over the world. And uh, I would like to ask the gentleman, you said that uh, identity is changeable in accordance with the circumstances. I would like to give you an example. Syria, for example, in 1968, had witnessed uh, discord and tribulation. Has the Syrian identity changed since the French mandate, for example? Uh, because uh, pan-Arabism was rampant after independence. Uh, has it carried on? I do think that when we talk about these social tensions from time to time, relate to the gap between the authority and the people, and nothing to do with the identity. I think it is to do with the distribution of wealth. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to thank you for the study. It seems that the microphone is not working, so I can't hear the gentleman properly. So I do apologize. The gentleman is talking about uh, the preferences when it comes to the Moroccan or the Maghreb uh, uh, workforce and the other workforce. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll look at three minutes for every uh, panelist to uh, uh, reply. I would like to thank everybody for their observations. Uh, and they elucidate uh, uh, my ideas uh, uh, greatly. I think these ideas were floated uh, uh, within uh, the framework of uh, a research project hopefully will get uh, funded and it studies the issue of uh, 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 building the capacities of the Gulf people to manage the diversification in the culture to become a social capital rather than a threat vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the identity and uh, the societal status. The main problem is or relates to providing the studies and the research necessary and uh, to attract highly skilled migrant. The uh, idea of uh, attracting highly skilled migrant has been there for 20 years. And the strategies of the development in the Gulf uh, uh, countries talk about uh, the, no the, the uh, knowledge-based economy. And uh, there are some trends that follow such compass uh, at work and in all the institutions of the society. The problem is as follows. The demand on immigration, does it conform with the transformation that we're seeing or is there a gap? I think that there is a gap because we're still continuing the building of the infrastructure and uh, the boom in the real estate uh, and construction uh, capabilities necessitates uh, 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 a special type of migrants. And as you know, this structure has still not changed. With some changes of the of those who come from a high skilled background in comparison with the representation of the low-skilled migrant. And this 
what makes the thing ambiguous vis-à-vis uh, -vis having a unified vision in the GCC countries. Indeed, one of the gentlemen said that, that uh, we are a focal point uh, for the work workers. Yes, we are, because the uh, Gulf countries are developing and uh, they are proactive in the developmental issues and they are innovative when it comes to economic projects. And this has led to the following, or perhaps the solution lies in the following, to have highly skilled migrants uh, and uh, also uh, to have uh, a low skilled migrant. And this, uh, the gap, and the gap lies between the two groups. Uh, we have uh, multiculturalism and diversity in the culture and we are facing insecurity, uh, insistent one, uh, and we think that uh, our identity is threatened. But how the identity would be threatened? Uh, it will be threatened when the cultural status is not entrenched, not established, or its features are not clear. I think we are dealing with tribes, uh, neighborhoods, uh, clans, and so on and so forth. And this uh, 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 plays a major role in uh, entrenching identity. Those people, for example, who are prone uh, for change uh, within the tribe are still cleaving to their identity, and nothing has changed to their identity. So there's no threat. What I want to say is to have to manage the immigration issue and uh, uh, as I said the diversity ought to be a capital for us rather than a threat. Dr. Asma has talked about uh, being or feeling as a minority. We don't need to fear. If our vision is clear then we ought not to fear. The gentleman has talked about uh, the industrialized countries, the U Europe and the advanced countries. They don't fear. Uh, they have a cap on immigration and they uh, take heed of the tributes of the of those who come to them. Uh, the high skilled migrants, for example, there are plenty of uh, 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 countries who uh, can allow 15 mates for the per, per family. That that that, that uh, uh, is appropriate in some cases. So I think uh, it's a case-by-case -case scenario, but uh, we need not to fear because uh, 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 things are changing all across the world. The integration strategy that uh, Mrs. Hassa has talked about, it is a demand now. We have the vision 2030, and we are talking about the knowledge-based economy, and we are asking for high skilled migrants. This kind of transformation uh, necessitates uh, the management of the immigration, indeed, to codify and uh, to talk about the immigration policy. We cannot have uh, families, uh, for example, from a certain culture and just leave it to it. No. We need uh, to uh, emphasize the issue of the building the bridges, uh, and uh, indeed the locals are uh, scared because uh, they think that uh, 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 these highly skilled migrants might compete with them, with the locals. They think that they are stealing our jobs, uh, uh, and this has created uh, competition inside the companies or the corporate culture. Uh, there is a, a study that I'm about to uh, uh, publish. It is to do with this particular issue, the uh, possibility of interaction and integration, and the things that Hassa has talked about, uh, and the awareness of uh, such policy. If you need to get into integration, you need first to understand the problems that precedes the or precedes the the integration. Thank you. Or well, perhaps I will, I will answer one more question. The issue of the identity and the fear, there are, there are some fears, uh, and they, uh, 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 
they follow the integration pattern and they train the newly arrived uh, to, for technology and communication and integration and in language and so on and so forth. The identity, as I said, is a relative phenomenon. One powers uh, all the social phenomena is uh, relative, relative. Relativity here doesn't mean uh, uh, to have uh, one uh, feature per se that is rigid and not flexible. No, it is uh, uh, flexible. Uh, uh, it can change. Uh, there are parameters, but it can change. And we are as socialists know that uh, identity is not an inevitable thing. Uh, uh, we have a room for the identity to be changed uh, day after day. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I'll move to the gentleman. Briefly, please. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, there are some comments on the paper. The paper was conducted to monitor the situation in the GCC countries and the imbalances thereby. And, uh, there is an applic application kind of uh, or a practical uh, matter that deals with that deals with the policies. The paper says that uh, there is an imbalance that leads to most of the sectors from the demographic point of view because uh, the Gulf uh, uh, countries have changed dramatically. Perhaps one of the things that I have uh, mentioned when it comes to the tackling the issue of the first imbalance, especially the preservation of the identity, it is to do with the Arab element. We have the capacity of integration in the Arab world. In the Arab world, I have uh, exporting countries and importing countries. Uh, talking about workers, uh, as you know, the Gulf countries uh, need uh, exporters uh, or need workers from uh, other countries. They are there in Jordan, in Iraq, in Egypt, in Morocco, in Tunisia, Algeria, and Syria, Sudan. Uh, they have plenty of technicians, plenty of highly skilled migrants, and low skilled migrants as well. So why don't we integrate? Because we have the same history, the same language. In the Gulf countries, the percentage of such people is inappropriate and disproportionate with the data that I have mentioned. So I prefer the Arab expatriates in my approach because I can uh, tap into this pool and why not bring them forward. There's also the point of uh, nationalization or Saudization or emanatization or indigenization. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, if the local person is capable of carrying out a job, why not employ him or her in the right position? Uh, uh, but some of the locals do not take certain jobs. I think it needs to raise the awareness of being able to work anywhere if he or she is capable of doing so. These are some of the solutions that I talked about in my paper. Well, there are uh, other issues as well. Thank you. Thank you. Please, uh, Dr. Microphone, please. I would like to be brief uh, because if we want to talk, we can talk for hours. As a matter of fact, my colleague, I would like to thank you for the Quran, uh, verse 27 of al -Jin. Allah says uh, he counted everything in number. And I believe in this number. Mathematics is a parameter. It doesn't change. It is in the mathematics in France and in Qatar. It's the same. The study covered the period from 1960 to 2012, and this uh, allowed the extrapolation. When it comes to the oil, we do not uh, pull the strings when it comes to the price of the oil. OPEC has nothing to do with uh, pricing. It is to do with the stock markets and the closed doors. And they do so because they have their own plans. In addition to that, the solution for Qatar is to have 
the Arab drops. Uh, the gentleman is playing on words here. He's saying upon because Qatar means a drop, and he's saying Qatar or to have Qatars uh, from the Arab world that means drops uh, from the old Arab world. Iraq has gone, Syria has gone, Lebanon has gone, Palestine has gone. Uh, Egypt is uh, facing deterioration, Libya has gone, there is no hope unless uh, the Gulf does something. We need uh, to have this valve of security. If the Gulf uh, will be destroyed, then this nation will not worship God anymore. Thank you very much. And peace be upon you. Thus, we declare the session adjourned. We'll be talking about it later. Thank you.